My name is Roger Powari. You don't need to, with my glass of water, that is called interbasin transfer. I run something called the National Drought Information System. I'm going to speak to some of the things we've been doing in the West, maybe for anywhere from about 20 minutes to a couple hours. And we'll go on. And we're hoping that some of the things we're doing moves us beyond this type of thing here. This is usually what we've been able to provide as experts. Rainfall may lessen drought. That is about the additional information we tend to produce. And so we want to ask, is there more to it than this? And what has driven changes and reforms? I'm going to speak a little bit, give you some background on the National Integrated Drought Information System called NIDUS. For those of you of a certain religious persuasion, I'll also ask, why is this NIDUS different from all other NIDUSes? Uh huh, a few jokes. <laughs> but we'll also begin to speak to, well, who are the partners involved? And how are we speaking towards getting at some of the issues in the West, both the high elevation and then some other equity-based concerns and questions? So, James, let me know when I have about 60 minutes to go. Um, here we are, what's drought? It's this continuum from the short term to the interannual to the decade. And when we talk about climate and climate adaptation, let me know if I'm going too fast, I can go faster if needed. So let, when we speak about this, we're talking about these many time scales. There's the footprint of a very famous drought, the Dust Bowl that everybody hears about. Here's the 1950s drought, a very different sort of experience. And then some of the things we, we've had in the past year I'll speak to. And when we talk about things like the intervening years, El Nino, I add the plus plus there simply because it's the one driver we have on the year-to-year -year variability. We don't know how it might change under climate change conditions. But when something only happens every four to seven years, it really only carries about 20% of the variance. There's about 80% of the stuff year-to-year -year that we don't fully understand. And we'll speak to some of that in a sec. So what causes droughts here? This. A persistent upper level ridge over the region. If we're going to talk about climate, climate change and drought, then we have to know how these things have changed and will change. What keeps this in place is this. It's warm at the top, so you don't have convection being developed, and you have reduced low level, you actually have reduced low level convergence or low level divergence. Air is moving out, and there's nothing rising up to cool down. That's what drives drought. And if we were to talk about climate change and the impacts of drought on the US, and especially over this area that we're going to speak to, the high elevation Colorado Plateau, then we have to know how some of these things might change as well. The stratosphere, right? It's all in the stratosphere, man. Anyway, so where are we? We were asked to do a couple things under this public law, and I'm going to bring this question back. People always say, wow, you got a public law behind you there. Congress, the president signed something. How'd you get to that point? How do you get to that point in which people begin to agree, wow, our personal psychology, as Harold Laswell used to say, our personal psychology filters into public law. How do the things we agree upon become law? We'll move a little bit into asking. We're asked to provide an effective drought early warning system, build upon existing partnerships, but most importantly, something we're talking about in adaptation, enable the nation to move from a reactive to a more proactive approach. That's always great. I love these things about anticipatory governance and stuff. In other words, you're telling me if I plan better, we'll do better. Well, that's pretty insightful. That took a few decades of research to tell us. I always have a few folks on the table that said, we need to be more proactive. And I always tell them, let's be proactive. You first. <laughs> that kind of keeps things quiet the moment you say that. It's easy to ask for these things. So let's talk about this whole NIDUS deal here and what work it's doing in the West, why it's, in, to some extent, it's seen as a so-called climate service, and then what that actually means. So there we go, enabling capabilities. To do what we do, we require the research. Guy is asking the fundamental question, where is the conversation between science and policy taking place? Where is that collaboration taking place? How is it informed? Who does it? What space does it exist in? We use the Regional Integrated Sciences and Assessments Program. Bill mentioned it. Jim Beiser was one of the creators of that program. He's in here somewhere. The Sectoral Applications Program. But I'm only pointing these out to tell you, in order to begin to ask, how do we deal with drought, we have to ask, what is the research that goes into this? But not on the time scale of research that says, I'll give you a grant, come back in three years, and you tell me what you did, and you come back and tell me, you know, you had a drought. 
So this is not exactly that. This is a lot more how does information become embedded in practice by identifying the socioeconomic effects, evaluating and transitioning drought information. We rely on other universities and on these regional integrated sciences and assessments. I'm putting this out there to say, well, what's the enabling capabilities if one is to develop information that leads to adaptation? The other thing we do is pull together many folks on modeling, analysis, and prediction. So on the one hand, you see the social science basis for research, and on the other hand, you have a bunch of different fingers. Okay, you have the research that says, what's the climate doing? Now that's all very important. It's great to have social science research. There's a lot of social science research that is un as unusable as the physical science research. And so the question is, how do we make these links between the things that we're studying on the impacts and the things that we're looking at on the physical basis to create information systems that actually <coughs> inform planning and practice? So what we try to do is create a bunch of pilot areas to develop early warning information systems. I always like to tell people, you know, from a research basis, it's great to do summertime research. You know, you go and you have a drive-by research set of questions. What are you doing? What do you need? Can I write it up? But the issue here is really how do these pilots become the system? How do these lessons for learning become the system? I always like to tell people we have a lot of pilots and no planes. All right? Lots of good examples, but nothing to drive it with into the long term. That begs the question that we heard a lot about this morning. How do these examples become systems of practice? This is a critical question. What do we do? I think Jill was saying, what do we do beyond knowing something? And we know a lot. Right? I like to call it learning and not doing. But anyway, as we move along, we'll start asking the question, well, look, here's our area. This is where we are right now, right there. If this was a current map, it would say, you are here. I always wonder how they know that. But the idea is let's ask the question, what's available? What are we doing in terms of early warning information systems that are not just short time scale, but across time scale? How does that information become embedded in practice? Well, we have to ask, what are the examples? We had a drought over the last few years. 2010, 2011, by the way, this is not a political map, right? That's not red state versus green, blue states or anything like that. And there's 2012, over 60% of the US was in drought for over five months. The only time that had happened before was 1934, in the middle of the Dust Bowl. Only time that spatial extent had occurred before. There's the present drought monitor. I think we're, in, in, we're still in one of these red areas here. And there's a lot of conflicts going on. So when we go out and talk to people, which we have for a long time, or talk at people, give them the illusion that you're listening, that's called stakeholder participation, is how did we get here? What are the status and antecedent conditions? Is this drought like others? That's the type of common sense question people ask. What impacts are, and where did they occur? What information is being provided? How bad am I to get? And how long will it last? Are information needs being met? And how are we planning for this year? That's a nice rational prescriptive view. There's also something called, to paraphrase Tom, uh, Thorsten Veblen, the conspicuous consumption of information. A lot of people want information so that they, they can report back that they're doing something. That doesn't mean they're doing anything with it. Right? This, is a, this, is, this is a little bit of a trick that we play in when we talk about how are people using what we give them. There is such a thing as the conspicuous consumption of information. I will ask you for something so it looks like I'm busy. Well, why do some places experience more drought conditions than others? Well, to begin with, some of them are dry. They have just barely enough rain or precip. There's large variations from place to place. Demand has already exceeded supply. All of a sudden, we start extending into different kinds of ideas behind drought. And we begin to ask for our region here, what drives climatological drought? Well, everybody, the first thing they say, well, it's El Nino, right? It's a Enso. Say it, Enso. Well, somebody's listening. Somebody's listening. Anyway, the idea here is this, though. That drought, this thing that we're looking at, started out 2010 to 2011, and I'm going to come back to what this means for climate change. 2010 to 2011. But the strength of the drought was not related to the strength of the La Nina event that began the drought. La Nina went away, 
the drought continued and in fact intensified. So this is an interesting question that begs what's the background doing? Right? In many of the cases, the interannual variability conditions can initiate, or in the case of drought, precipitate a drought, but what you really have are other conditions that are driving the severity once things have kicked into place. Well, how do we bring that into a planning framework? If we look at the, this part of the world, the, the southwest US, and you ask what is affecting us? Warm Atlantic multidecadal, coal Pacific decadal, and they vary on very different time scales. Very, very different time scales. When you add extremes and variability onto a background changing climate, what we get is a surprise in the system. That's what we get. We don't actually know what we get. It's not linearly additive. And yet surprises are the things from the Mississippi drought uh, floods of the 20s and the 30s to the, drought, the Dust Bowl to the drought of 1977. Those are the things that shape our adaptations. Those are the things on which we learn. And so we have to ask, let's not throw our hands up at surprises, but ask how best can we use them. So we'll get to that. So the drought is continuing in many places, but it's because it's driven by those decadal signals. The interannual signal has now quieted down, and it's continuing in the West because of the decadal signal. And that's only the decadal signal. When we ask the question, there's July 2010, May 2012, July 2011, July 2012, January 2013, there was a jump in the aerial coverage of the US from 28% to 53% in just these months, May 2012 to July 2012. What does that tell us? So on the one hand, we have the decadal signal. On the other hand, we have El Nino. We haven't even talked about the background climate ver temperature signal as yet. And yet, we're seeing a jump in the extent of the drought that goes from 35% to the largest spatial extent since the worst droughts on record in the United States. The 1950s were pretty dry, but there were a few years in there that were very wet, you know? So we got, we'll think through some of these types of things. This is still current. This is just a, some analysis that Richard Seeger and they did. They've updated the issue. We're still projecting dry conditions from precip minus evapotranspiration. You might get atmospheric rivers or a few of them, but they're not going to help you recover from a long-term event. So on the one hand, we have ENSO, we've got the decadal scale, we've got this long-term precip minus evapotranspiration. You have other things such as dust on snow that John mentioned this morning. And when we talk about early warning and planning and embedding not early warning as a forecast, but early warning information systems as early warning on impacts, communication, but also how information gets embedded in practice, we have to deal with all of these time scales in order to think about adaptation. So I'm gonna to come to what we've been trying to do in this framework. I'm not gonna talk about the pine beetles, because that was a whole other thing that you guys have dealt with, right? I always recommended that maybe we should get Yoko Ono to come along, since that might end the beetle problem. Anyway, so, I'll let you talk about the pine bark beetles, more technically. Left hand, not the right. right, okay, not these guys, right? Okay, good. So, since 1880, there's been a strong signal of the US in warming, no question. That, that's there in the record. The percent of the US experiencing moderate to severe drought has jumped suddenly in the first decade of this century. There's no question about that. What this tells us, though, that even a perfect sea surface temperature prediction will not capture anything more than half of what is driving the drought because of all these different timescales, including the temperature signal. This becomes very important when we're talking about adaptation, right? Because we're not just talking about naively handing people model output and saying, how will you respond to this? Or, as I like to call it, helping them do the wrong thing more precisely. The Southwest drought may be, entered, it may be entering into a drought conditions, but the opportunities for alleviating that drought are declining. In other words, you might not see more frequent drought, but when we are in one, the opportunities for alleviating that drought might be declining based on that temperature signal, based on the, what's happening in the decadal background. A complete explanation of these droughts, however, can't just evoke oceanic forcing, but also what is happening in the atmosphere. All time scales matter. We know that from planning, we know that in development, 
High time we stop treating extremes and climate change as orthogonal. We're still doing it through the UNFCCC. We're still treating it as if these are somehow separate problems to respond to on different timescales. It's like the Avignon Bridge, right? It's the old saying, you know, uh, you're out there drowning, you're 10 meters away, here's five meters of rope, that's your climate change funding. Forget about the other five meters, you'll have to get that somehow before you drown. The idea there is many of the development banks are waking up to that issue, but I don't think the UNFCCC has yet. Oh, high five, I agree with you on that, yeah. So what are we gonna talk about? What, the Upper Colorado River Basin, coordinated operations, what are we doing with them? Well, a few years ago, demand exceeded supply on this system. What does that tell us? As Lorna was saying, that means if demand has, is above supply, it doesn't take a major drought to push you into a system. This is what she means by maybe climate is becoming a dominant factor. Because if you're at the edge, it doesn't take you that much to push you over. State of California doubled its population since 1970. Total amount of water use went down. There are things we can do about this, but when you're at the edge, it doesn't take much to push you over. We're in the West. Some of you, I think we have a lot of Germans in the room, right? Yeah, well, so Karl May, anybody remember who that is? <laughs> I'm just kidding. Never made it out West, but he wrote a lot about the West, right? He made it as far as Chicago, I think, in 1915, you know, between 1910 and 1915. So here's how we manage the watershed. We collaborate effectively. We discuss the questions. We have a long history of planning and practice. But somewhere in the back is this environment that we're triaging, and it's asking, wow, what are the design specs on this stand here? Right? So we have to ask, that's what the environment is doing. There's a, there's a serious, one of the best adaptation efforts in the world having had to go and count these for IPCC happening right in the Colorado Basin. What is that? It's not putting information into play. It's stepping back and saying, we're going to stand back and ask, do we understand how to deal with these problems? And we will not sue each other until 2026. This is a major adaptation issue. This is a major opportunity that says, you know what? I'm not going to pretend that I know what the models are telling me. I'm going to stand back and say, how do we work this out among the states? and who's using what information and how. So that learning can take place, something that Linda keeps telling us, instead of simply rushing information into practice. Minute 319, the first time in the Colorado River history in which water was put aside specifically for the Delta. It's the first time that that's had happened. So where are we? This is the thing that led to the creation of NIDAS, 25% of inflow. This was last year, 45%. This is the second driest 12 year period in the history of the Colorado. So you have significant individual events, but then you have this long term trend. Some driven by, by temperature, some driven by drought, a lot driven by just natural variability. Oh, I like to put this up, people always say, well, who are your stakeholders, who are you talking to? They're there. What have we done? Is basically create a set of outlooks using the research from those teams that I mentioned, using the research from the resources, the sectoral applications, but also then creating early warning information systems that looks across climate and tourism in the Colorado Plateau that was raised this morning, outlooks for fires, but then using that short-term outlook to ask the longer-term question. As we work with you on how this information gets into planning, how are longer-term risks being taken into account? And that has actually found a lot of favor with the Western governors in the West. How do you secure the investments into the long term? As with any other thing, if you can't help someone in the short term, there's no reason for them to believe that you can help them into the long term. We also help produce a, a bunch of indicators. If a drought indicator is varying this way and we're saying it's gonna be like this, where are diversions in water taking place? Tying the indicators to the very thing that people are managing a little bit more directly. Last year, the Rio Grande ran dry all of the water which comes from the mountain regions just south of us here pretty much disappeared. During summer, all of the water being used to meet this allocation came from groundwater. And we're not sure how fast that's going. Right? But I'm gonna give you another perspective about this drought. That's a great for a managed system. We're gonna talk a little bit about tribal communities in the West and ask how are their needs being met? Here's what's happening 
There's the drying signal. This is where, this is called Dinebikea, which is where the Navajo homeland. There's the drying signal. We're seeing a change from vegetation to sand dunes in the Four Corners region, being measured by people like Margaret Hisa, Red Sierra, USGS, and so on. We talk a lot about the sea ice margin. We talk a lot about high elevation. But there's a lot that's going on on the semi-arid margins that we need to think about. This, is, this actually occurred in the last uh, 12 years. Right? They've passed the threshold. And basically, what we're seeing is a rapid decline in that part of the world. What we're doing with them is creating new scenarios for planning. Working with people on these are the transitions that are taking place. It's going to shrubland, it's going to novel ecosystem, short grass prairie. Which of these things meet the cultural needs for ceremonies and ceremonial practices? Which area do we then work on revegetating to recover some of the short grass prairie, some of the shrubland that are used in the ceremonial practices? This is one way in which we look at scenarios in trying to embed transitions into what people are looking at for making sure that their, their next step, at least something is protected from what they keep. So let's begin to think about this. We've got, there's the Secretary of Agriculture, the CEQ head, Secretary Salazar. We got them to read out some of these outlooks to the governors. They call us in for a bunch of hearings. But really, more than anything else, we have to ask ourselves, are we doing anything that's better off? In spite of all the hearings and all of this stuff, and all the evidence from what we've been trying to do says that the actions, people are coordinating better than they did in 2002. They're getting better information. They actually have less conflict over who's using what information and how. That is a nature of some of the capacity building that we've tried to do. And so for the last couple of slides, this is only have a couple more. I actually don't. I like to create optimism among the moderator. Is that we go from a centralized to a decentralized view in terms of how information is being practiced. But you can't be completely decentralized. Standards of practice have to be centralized. And this is where we begin to ask the question, what is needed at each scale? In NIDAS, we create in each area public awareness groups, edu education, monitoring and forecasting, interdisciplinary research. We do that at the regional scale. We have the feedback from the watershed level. And only then does it go up to the national level to highlight priorities. And this becomes a way in which we ask, well, what are we providing? What's the nidus touch? An information pedigree. For years, we heard, you know, Silvio and, well, Funtowitz and Ravitz have been talking about the nature of a pedigree of information. What constitutes that in practice? Authoritative, accessible. How do we overcome impediments to the information flow? That's precisely how this system is designed. So some of this is up there, but I wanted to get to one last thing that Linda was mentioning, the nature of learning. Are we learning and not doing, and where and where do opportunities for learning occur? This is a nice prescriptive approach. You monitor, you evaluate, you learn, you innovate. But it never follows that precisely, right? Because we have different values. We have different values about what constitutes effective information. So I'm going to wrap up. This is, this is definitely it. What has led, if we take an empirical view, this is all empirical, from all of those experiments we've done with the Reese's and others, what creates collaboration? What creates reforms? What has led NIDAS to be a national level recognized effort? Why was it called into place to begin with? We planned through crisis learning and redesign. Without focusing events, it's hard to get people to pay attention about the future. There's leadership at each level, not just the top, as Jill was pointing out this morning. The pioneers, the policy entrepreneurs come from each level. But really, things like the RISAs and, and others have made the collaborative framework between research and management evident. This is different, maybe different from co-development. It may be different from actionable science. Because what we push the RISAs to do is not become an advocate. And it becomes too easy in a co-development framing for people to become advocates for the people for, with whom they're co-developing. In other words, if I'm working with Peabody Coal, does that mean I can't help the Navajo as well, right? This is a critical issue and critique of the co-development idea. And the most important thing is a, is a collaborative framework where we work out the difference between decision quality and acceptability. Decision analysis tools give us an idealized view of the best decision. 
The most acceptable decision is not always the best decision. And the trade-offs in which those occur are the only things that have led to reform. The best adaptation practices from a cost-benefit ratio has been land use planning and design. And we have to ask, why is it, in spite of showing the economic value of that as a payoff, it's not the priority. Things like retrofitting and so on are. Make, building the culvert a little bigger, rather than asking, are we asking the right question? So today, and over the next few weeks, the, you're okay to, oh, right. I, I thought he said, are you doing all right? The President's Climate Action Plan is being rolled out. Some of us in the room made some contributions to that. For once, the administration has come out and basically said, we're going to act on climate. It's being rolled out starting today. He gave a speech in June. It's going to focus on mitigation, some carbon issues, mostly preparing the US and international partnerships. Anybody could read Morse code? Right? So this is going to be the, the way we roll things out. So I want to keep this in mind, because this is how the agencies and their partners are going to act. <laughs> Even the littlest among us know a little color aberration could get you some water. Thank you. here for a, a little uh, a brief you discussion. Um, I, I have one question for you. Later on. Um, I, I wonder if you could elaborate a little bit more on what you mean by pedigree. Mm. Um, a pedigree there of are information. users at all scales that would uh, are benefiting and, and would like to benefit from the information that NIDAS provides from sure. farmers uh, to individuals living in drought areas to states to basin managers uh, all the way up to Congress. And so, um, are you, by pedigree, do you mean, how are you providing that information to that disparate set of users? Are you doing it through direct channels? Are you creating a network of knowledge? Are you creating standards? Can you elaborate on what that means? Sure. Okay, so, we know something about credibility. We know something about what constitutes author authoritative information beyond the functional forms of the models and things that we're using. And probably the richest thing that brings a pedigree to information is understanding the procedure and experience of the people with whom you're dealing. I don't do it when I, in a hearing, I'm not trying to convince someone in Congress that, wow, it's all about climate change. I'm trying to find out, is there something that I'm doing that helps you answer a question that you need answered? That's different from what do you want and how can I answer it, because that doesn't mean we're answering the right question. What we ask then is, for you, where are the innovations taking place? Where are your investments being, being addressed? What is the spread of information that you're using? And how can what I'm providing you or whomever help you secure those investments? So the pedigree is procedural. The technical aspects are something we're all familiar with. The quality of the data, the functional form of the models, and the contextual aspects of that application. So you're saying the pedigree is more about knowing and understanding the user than understanding the producer. Well, 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 I don't, uh, for ma making the distinction means that something in between has to be handed off. And there's so much lost in translation that I actually think that what, where the question we begin to ask is, is much more along the lines of getting, finding out from folks about what they consider um, is needed to transform what they're doing. So it's less, it's, it's, even, it's beyond communication. Because a communication framing can, help, can sometimes make us ignore the fact that there are base, base social values that are driving what we're doing. What this is basically saying is, how does this help you secure the things in which you're interested? That's a little different. <laughs> Comment? Uh, Susie? I was wondering if you could go back to the risk information governance. Yeah, yeah, sure. Just talk about that a little bit. Like, what, what were the elements of that? And just jump through that really quick. Yeah, well, you know, he wanted a 15 minute talk for 100 minutes. I'm just, I'm just giving you a crack. Okay, this thing? Yeah. Okay. So, this was something we drew for the global assessment report for the UN International Strategy on Disaster Risk Reduction. Right. The idea here is what is needed at each level. We hear about cultures of practice, cultures of partnerships. That's definitely the case. Adaptation occurs locally. Right? 
But how do we know that one group, and we learned this from adaptive management, one of the most innovative laws ever produced in the US system was the 1980 Northwest Power Planning Act. It was the thing that launched adaptive management within the US. When doing that, we know, we understood where adaptation, planning, and practice occurred. However, for a basin in which it was implemented, like the Columbia, you couldn't have one, one sub-basin doing one thing, another one doing another, with different standards of practice. This is where the political authority and policy coherence exists. And that is in a partnership, in that case, between the states, the feds, and the tribes. The decentralization of information is allowing the resources to reach to the ground. There's a whole slew of stuff on decentralization and practice in disaster risk management, which has not been successful, simply because the capabilities were not there to carry out practice, and local elites took over instead. So the culture of partnership involves ensuring political authority and coherence. And this is actually national and regional, or state level, together with the communities. But it can't be all local. Neither can it be all national. We don't want to be, get so local that the um, sheriff is the mayor's brother-in-law, like we used to have it. Right? So local authorities do play a role, but communities play a stronger role. The idea of getting voice you know, Hirschman passed away at the end of December. Exit voice and loyalty, very, very critical piece of understanding. What creates voice in a, in a system and what allows it is really political authority. So getting a handle on what is needed at each of these stages is actually the goal. And we designed the system with, with that in mind. That doesn't mean it's working that way. In one of your slides, you said there is a trade-off oh, right. between quality and yeah. acceptability. Yeah. Yeah. And personally, I understand that. Yeah. And that's a very hard message for the scientists. I'm with you. Who will not want to compromise on quality. Never so very, very good. It's probably true that this is the reality today. Yeah. Can you comment on that? Um, I, I fully agree. Oh, you wanted more. OK. <laughs> So, so the tra but this is really an interesting point because one of the issues that people, you know, we confuse deciding quickly but wrongly with decisiveness, right? The idea here is that when we have stakeholder processes, when we engage people, and, and by that I mean whoever is affected, objectivity is whoever is affected, right? We actually are searching for agreement on action. That's straightforward when your product line is simply manufacture, prototype, and deliver. Works for washing machines. When it's about watersheds, as everybody in this room knows, it's a more complex set of values. And the agreement might not be the best decision. Classic case, the Columbia Basin, the trade-off between salmon and hydropower. At some point, agreement is about triage, not about saving everything. And so what we have in this case is very much the trade-off between a decision analytic view where the optimal Bayesian probabilities can be established and actually how people make decisions in practice. It relates to the question that James was asking. The most influential piece of paper written that led to the Northwest Power Planning Act was a paper by Cecil Andrus, who was the Secretary of the Environment um, uh, of the Interior. And he wrote a paper called The Fish of Memory. And The Fish of Memory was about growing up as a kid going to fish for salmon and then not being able to do that right now with his children and grandchildren. That resonated with everybody across the board. It wasn't about, let's, let, it wasn't about who was right. It wasn't about anything other than where are your values embedded and then how do we help secure those. Now, that doesn't mean all values are good. Reification of the local, as Jules Pretty and everybody else notes, local and social capital at the local level is important, but if you have gender issues, is that what you want to sustain? And so the issue here in quality versus acceptability is we can optimize a decision-making framework, but in practice, the trade-off leads us to conclude the right action, which is don't let the perfect be the enemy of the good. But isn't that, aren't you using the wrong words? No, this is English. Implies that is the best way, all things considered. Yeah, I, every time I hear this, yeah. I, I think to myself, no, you've got something wrong mm -hmm. in the model. Yeah. How do I know that? Because people didn't follow the model. Right. Right. 
So essentially, we're wrong about something. So it's not quality versus acceptability. It's not estimating things correctly, given the final decision maker's estimates, which by definition are correct. They did. Right. So what, what is being argued is the idea of the distinction in risk management and risk analysis, because we're using a climate risk management framework, on what people call the quality of the decision. Now, if you want to make a broader statement about it, yes, I agree with you. When we're talking about how people analyze for the stand, from the standpoint of applying climate information in practice, decision quality means something in particular. Right? Yes, it means I'm something in, it means something in, it. that's what it means in statistics. The idea, however, is this. You can draw back and say, what's the best decision, right? And the best decision is one that is objective in the sense of bringing all relevant information to bear on a problem. So I don't think it's the wrong decision in the context of a risk management framework, which is what's being advocated. So I think this is really critical, that we have to be clear that when we talk about what constitutes the best decision, we're talking about an objective decision that brings all relevant information to bear. When you're talking about the quality of a decision, it's the one that has the li highest probability, uh, likelihood of an outcome. And that's a clear distinction. But you're claiming objectivity. I did. And, and decisions are never completely Okay, no, 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 I'm not claiming objectivity. Don't go down, don't create a straw man to argue one. I said objectivity was bringing all relevant information. That's why, that's why the acceptability is critical. For, because for me, a decision that is acceptable is also a good decision. So don't create a straw man. To, 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 to uh, play with the of this, yeah. one of the problems that I see, and I'm engaged in another large project around knowledge sure, 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 sure. for sustainability and decision making, is that the whole set of data that are, around which a Bayesian probability is predicated has a whole set of, of local and practical yeah. information absent yeah. from it. So then the quality and acceptability have rather different meaning Correct. to different members of that yeah. stakeholder community. I'm with you. I'm with you. So that becomes, a, I think, a very serious issue when you have, if you will, rather diverse kinds of stakeholders, right. which often we do. Right. I, no, I'm with you, uh, but that's why I think acceptability is a very critical criterion. But then again, we also have to then be clear that managing that process is a very deliberate and negotiated process. And let's not pretend that somehow you get a, best, a good decision out of that just because you ask people. But don't you right. view acceptability as a, as a diminutive? Of quality? Is it more diminutive than? Than quality? quality? I think they all form part of the best decision, of the best decision-making process, not an outcome. So it's, it's a way more socially constructed issue than you're describing. So. Okay, well, let's That's Roger. good. This is a good discussion. We're going to need to move on now, but let's thank Roger once again, and we're going to reset the room for a final discussion. Thank you, thank you, thank you.